cutting, uh, moving, uh, manipulating, changing representations. Um, so those are the sorts of things that happen in, in that interaction phase. So let's talk a little bit about ParaView. ParaView is built on top of the visualization toolkit, uh, which has been around for uh, since 1993, coming out of GE Corporate Research and Development. Uh, they spun off in a company called Kitware in 1998, and have gone on to actually make a number of other uh, really interesting uh, APIs, uh, including the In Insight Toolkit, which is funded by the NIH uh, for doing image data, uh, and more recently, in conjunction with Sandia National Labs, Titan, so they're doing InfoVis. So one of the big problems that the InfoVis field is facing is there's lots of great tools out there, but there, a lot of them are written in Java, have very interesting uh, re representations and interactions, but they don't scale. Most of them will top out at, at, at a few tens of thousands of points, okay? And researchers want to go into hundreds of thousands, millions, uh, terabytes, and so forth. So this is uh, really exciting. Uh, that we're now seeing some of this merger or, or, or transfer of this architecture that's worked so well for scientific visualization over to information visualization. And VTK, again, being an API, is actually at the heart of a number of other uh, scientific visualization packages, competitors to pair of you, if you would. Uh, so if you use something, I've used Visit, another really good one, 3D Slicer, MyAvi, VizTrails. These are all building on top of VTK. So if you understand that VTK pipeline and architecture, again, it makes you sort of um, able to move easily between those various tools. Okay. Paraview's been around itself since 1999. Uh, it's more end user application. Uh, it adds a GUI plus a parallel backend by itself. VTK does not have a parallel backend. And if you did, you'd have to, you know, there's things you can do obviously with, you know, in conjunction with MPI uh, and various codes, you, you can make it parallel. But uh, it's kind of tricky to do. And if that's not your area of research, you would much rather have someone else do it and then just leverage that tool. So, so that's the idea behind Paraview. And the Paraview pipeline looks something like this. You know, a modification of that general visualization pipeline, uh, but using some specific terminology that have sources, that goes through uh, filters that modify the data in some way, uh, mappers convert data into objects. Uh, VTK introduces the concept of actors that kind of sit between the abstract visualization space of mappers and the particular implementation. Uh, VTK, in this case, is written with OpenGL, so, so it actually uh, creates actors uh, that can work uh, with the graphics cards, and then you actually render that on some window, and then you, that window is, is part of a display device with an interaction device, and you can move through it. So that architecture provides a couple of interesting places where you could split up the pipeline between a server on the back end, your HPC resources, and your display on the front end, be it your desktop computer or cave or tile wall. Um, if you do it here, you do it here, you're actually going to be transferring the data, you know, the data from your application might be filtered down uh, but that, that could be practical. In most cases, probably not terribly practical because um, you've got a lot of data. You could transfer your, your geometry commands uh, or your graphics commands uh, to your renderer. Uh, that happens in some cases. In fact, that's uh, one of the, that's the default mode for the client server mode in, um, uh, in Paraview that it'll start up, the back end will send uh, the graphics uh, commands or the, the geometry to your local render, figuring that most people have some type of hardware acceleration. Or in some cases, you might actually want to have the rendering be done on the back end and actually just transfer images or pixels to be reassembled on your screen. So you've got a couple of different interesting client server architectures. And here's from the, uh, uh, the Paraview tutorial um, that uh, Kitware puts out. Uh, they show the, the, the different modes. Uh, it has a client, which is actually the GUI plus the uh, uh, display windows, uh, the data server, and the render server. And when you start it up as an application on your desktop, and by the way, uh, I forgot to mention, but Paraview is free for you to download. Uh, it's open source. Uh, you can compile it yourself, or they have pre-compiled binaries for Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. Uh, to get a lot of the uh, advanced functionality on the back end, because there's so many different flavors of MPI and such, uh, they often recommend on your server side that you uh, do recompile it yourself. But it's freely available. 
and uh, um, so I encourage you to try it out. Uh, the, uh, uh, so when you run it on your desktop machine, it's actually bringing up an instance of the client, the server, and the, uh, the uh, data server, and the render server all together. In the common client server mode, it actually creates one or more pairs of data servers and render servers. Um, and then those communicate across the network to your desktop client. Um, you can actually break out the data servers from the render servers, but like we talked before, that usually means you're, you're moving your original data set, uh, which in many cases uh, could be prohibitive. And again, this, is the, this architecture is the key to pair of use scalability. Uh, a lot of apps have been developed uh, that are really nice visualization apps, but it's much more difficult to go back and to, uh, to uh, retrofit scalability into an architecture. Uh, so Paraview has done this from the start, and that's where um, uh, that's why I recommend it. So it's sort of like learning to drive on a, uh, if you haven't done any visualization before, you might be learning to drive on a Ferrari or a, a, a Abrams tank or something if you want to use speed or power. Um, and you might not need all that speed or power, but at some point, uh, perhaps you will, and you'll be glad you have it. Um, and just one of the other options there is that you have a variety of options for displaying. So you can go from your client to a server cluster and out to a, uh, uh, a tile display. So let's look at some of the GUI components that you have in um, uh, Paraview. This is a slightly older uh, uh, screenshot uh, that I have here. but. Um, you can actually bring up one or more render windows. It's not until the, the third version that you actually have more than one window open at a time. So that, that's actually really nice. Um, but then basically what you have over here in the upper left-hand corner is a representation of the, um, of the pipeline. And you'll see there's a little eyeball next to each one. So you can actually turn uh, representations off and on in the, um, in the rendering window. Uh, but that you'll actually see as you connect various uh, uh, filters together that actually create a little tree structure there. So again, you get a nice visual representation of that pipeline that you're putting together. For each object in there, there's, uh, there's several tabs. One has parameters specific to that object. Uh, every one of them has the ability to display some type of representation. In some cases, it's simply just the bounding boxes. It doesn't know how to render that, but it, it knows something about the data and what its extents are in 3D space. And then information tells you something about what pair of you thinks it got when it read that file or performed that filtering operation. So we'll show you those things there. And there's lots of different file formats. Um, some are specific to, to VTK and pair of you. Uh, and then there's actually import filters uh, for, um, for lots of other commonly used sorts of things, including like protein data banks. So you can use this for molecular visualization. Probably not the greatest, but sometimes you want to bring that model in as a reference towards some data set that you've computed. A lot of people use uh, uh, HDF, uh, Insight is a commercial package, it's quite popular, visual elevation maps. Uh, you can bring in various geometry files, Burmol, uh, and so forth. And, and by the way, you can also create your own sources. So if you're just learning, they have something called a source menu there, which lets you create your own points or your own grids. Uh, they have a nice little fractal thing to let you create 2D or 3D fractals. Uh, so you don't even have to worry about going out and finding a file that the pair of you will generate a file for you or a data set for you and let you start manipulating it. So demands of the workflow. What do you, uh, um, these are things like, uh, how big is your data? How many time steps? Uh, how complex is your visualization? How, uh, how many pixels? How, what, how, what type of resolution do you want to draw? You do it in stereo, you have twice as much. So um, Paraview, again, is designed to keep things uh, interactive and scalable. So it's going to try to do some smart things. It's going to try to protect you from yourself so that you don't overwhelm your machine uh, and, uh, and crash it uh, unnecessarily, crash the application. It doesn't crash your computer. Um, the limitations of your computer could be the memory, the CPU, the uh, GPU, uh, which kind of breaks down into polygons and pixels, networking bandwidth, internal bus bandwidth. There's lots of possibilities. So, you know, you can, and there's lots of interesting computer science research projects in sort of analyzing that, the, the pipeline and the performance and, and, and optimizing things. Uh, but to preserve interactivity, Paraview uh, tries to do some things like subsampling the data set. So, uh, in some cases, it doesn't try to render all the data. You might want to be, you need to be aware of that so that if you do, for some reason, want to see all the data, to know where to find those various 
folks in the program and turn off those flags or say, yes, give it all to me. I'm a big person. I can handle it if my machine crashes uh, or slows down. Uh, I'll be okay. Uh, level of detail where it tries to, uh, when, when, when you're not moving, there's no problem there. So it can render the data at full resolution, but as soon as you start moving, it automatically tries to drop you down to a lower level of resolution. So the goal by default is to keep interactivity high. Um, my cache time steps, um, and then there is a, a feature there where you, you'll find you have to always remember to go back and push the accept button when you make changes in a parameter. So if you're grabbing a slider and um, you know, um, adjusting that value, that could actually uh, be generating uh, dozens or hundreds of events where it might have to re-execute some or all of the pipeline. So instead of you know, doing that every time the computer gets an event, it waits to you get your slider to the right location, hit the accept button, and then update the pipeline once. This is what some of those things look like. If you had a high resolution data set here, it can actually go to a lower resolution so you can see it's, it's, it's clustered some vertices together, try to uh, maintain the important features in the data set, but it's not, you, you are gonna lose something. Or it could actually drop down to a lower resolution um, if you're doing some type of uh, off-screen rendering. So, let's look at a couple of examples here. Um, one builds on the, uh, uh, the case that uh, uh, Justin presented earlier in his talk on the data capacitor, which was the nuclear pasta project. Uh, this was a simulation of dense neutron-neutron interaction, uh, such as occurs in the crust of neutron stars and other uh, uh, fantastic places. And it results in what they call pasta-like forms. So basically what you see down at the bottom are three different densities of neutrons. And as the, uh, if they get more dense, they get more complicated structures. Um, I didn't see pasta in this. I saw more like um, uh, dumplings or, or, or bubble gum. But uh, um, uh, anyway, this was the work of, uh, of, of uh, Charles Horowitz and, uh, and Don Berry here at IU. So what we want to do is take a, a look. We'll start with some point data. Uh, look at a single time step and show you some options there. Uh, we'll look at how you can handle multiple time steps. Uh, Pairview is, is, uh, does some really nice things. You know, as a computer scientist, you tend to uh, write out stuff in very logical ways. You know, the same base file name, 0001. Uh, it looks for those, those patterns within a, uh, a file system. And if you try to load one, it'll try, it thinks you want to load all of them. And, and uh, uh, that's nice. So it can, it can handle temporal data very well. Uh, and then we'll show that just starting with the data that you have, part of the visual is the trick of being a good visualization expert uh, is to go beyond uh, the data that you've presented and to see if you can derive uh, various additional forms of data that give you more insight into the, uh, um, what's going on. So we actually can derive some vector data, derive some volume data uh, as well. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So I'm going to go over, and I already have a pair of you running here. And I'm going to go uh, this little shortcut for just file open. And I'll go down to where I've got my VTK files uh, stored locally. The, the, again, the nice thing, we won't actually run a distributed version here. Uh, but uh, if I did, what would happen, I, I'd do one extra step and make a connection to the remote server. And then everything else would look uh, pretty much the same. I would notice some delays uh, as data uh, is transferred, depending on the size of the data. So here's my, uh, let me just grab a, uh, so there's my uh, data. So now I have one object, a data file, it's a VTK point file. And um, I can see it hasn't actually read it yet because it's, remember the apply button. So this could be a big data set, might take a long time to, uh, to read. So you have to tell it, yep, I haven't messed up anything. So you hit apply and boom, the, because it's actually point data, uh, it went ahead and did what it thought was intelligent, it, it put a point there at each location. So now you can come over here and uh, uh, turn around and ma manipulate that. You can uh, uh, zoom in and out and so forth. Good question? How many points in there? Good question. How many points in there? Um, actually, I know, but how would one find out? If you go over to the information tab, uh, it's going to tell you that it's a polygonal mesh. Now here's where, one of the things where you need to learn a little bit about VTK. Um, even if you only have point data, 
uh, it goes into a class of files called the polygonal mesh because it thinks ultimately you might try to connect those points together. Um, so you have to read that with a grain of salt, but there's 30 